Hey guys, it's Rich with another Saintly Sunday video. In this one, we are discussing Saint Alphonsus Liguori. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, for my reference material, I am using, again, the Lives of the Saints. Um, this is by Catholic Book Publishing Company. Uh, you will see all of my references down below. I'm also using a Catholic website that uh, will be down in the bottom bar that discusses his life. Um, kind of in a brief synopsis uh, from a Catholic perspective, and I'm also using his uh, Wikipedia page that is also down below, and The Magical Power of the Saints. Now, I did a book review on this, and you can check out that video. Uh, I think I have it tabbed under book reviews. I can't remember. Um, but yes, I did do a book review, and you can also find that book review on christopaganism.com under the book reviews tab. So you can go there to see the book review on that. Now this book only gives a little tiny bit right here. Uh, this is not a, this is a picture of uh, St. Anthony of Padua, which I do like St. Anthony of Padua. But this here, little synopsis, this is basically what St. Al, as I'm going to call him, because Alphanus is a long word to say and I'm going to get tongue-tied and so I'm going to just call him St. Al. Um, it basically only has feast day, day of the week, color of the candle, and uh, what you petition him in, which I'll get to that towards the end of the video. I, I do want to say that I was trying to use Mystic Saints and Sages by Judica Ilias, but it does not cover Saint Al in the, uh, in the Mystic Saints and Sages book, and I wish it did, but it doesn't. So, Judica, what the hell? Come on now. <laughs> Now, seriously, that is a wonderful book. If you are into um, venerating saints or even just learning about saints and uh, mystics and sages within the craft that covers uh, a multicultural uh, span, wonderful book to get. Does not have Saint Al in there. So, anywho, anyway, let's get into the details of Saint Alphonsus Liguori, Saint Al. So for one, the feast day is on the 1st of August. And I know that the past two weeks, the uh, feast days have been on Saturdays. Unfortunately, that's not going to be the case every time. Basically how I picked the saints, if it's in this book between the, the Monday and the following Sunday, that's how I picked them. I just tried to pick some ones that were interesting uh, to me that gave kind of a well-rounded view of the person's life. So this one actually happens to be on the 1st of August. So I believe that's Tuesday. So it gives you a couple days to uh, get some stuff together. And I'm just going to start with the uh, little biography first, and then, and then we'll get into some of the other stuff after that, some of the more esoteric things. And another thing I want to add before I get into the biography is that this is the first male that we've had as a saint. I kind of want to keep it um, pretty balanced uh, between males and females because I think both genders, and I, I do want to specify that you know gender fluidity and all that stuff is great. Most of the time we see saints as either male or female, so I, I will be using the pronouns of he and she um, accordingly. Now, if there is a gender fluid uh, type of saint, I don't know of any off the top of my head, but if I come by that one, I will use the pronoun of they. And I just want to be all inclusive of that uh, so everybody understands. But I also want to have the equality of male and female because I think there's a lot to learn from both, both genders when we are talking about saints and what they have to teach us. And more importantly, what we can learn from them and apply to our own life to be better, you know, people in general. So I hope I'm making that clear. Uh, I hope I didn't go off on too much of a tangent. But let's go ahead and get into the biography of St. Alphonsus Liguori. So St. Al was born on the 27th of September in 1696. This is also the first saint that we have that's you know beyond or removed a lot more from biblical times so this is a um, 
a lot of firsts for this series. So anyway, born 1696 on the 27th of September in Marinella, Italy. This is near Naples. Uh, I, I'm going to mispronounce things uh, periodically, and you know what? We're just going to accept it and move on. Anyway, uh, from two different sources I have, one source that says he was the eldest of eight, and another source that says he was the eldest of seven. Um, either way, the oldest child. So that, that was consistent in what I found. His father was a naval officer, and his mother was of a Spanish descent. Uh, I have read that she was more of a pious woman, more of a religious type of woman, and his father was very military, uh, had a lot of hopes and aspirations for uh, St. Al. Um, but because of his health issues, he wasn't able to pursue a military profession like his father evidently wanted for him. So his father had him educated as a lawyer. He did get his doctorate, uh, and he became a pretty successful lawyer. And within a span of eight years, he only lost one case. It was the final case that uh, made him leave practicing law, and he also felt a calling from God. So at the age of 30, he was ordained, and this was on the 21st of December, uh, seventeen. 26, sorry. And I kind of find that a little bit or serendipitous that he was ordained on Yule. Kind of, uh, kind of thought provoking on whether or not, uh, you see the similarities there. I, I don't know. So maybe there's something there. Maybe I'm just reading into something that actually isn't there. But, I find it kind of interesting that he was ordained on Yule of 1726. Um, anyway, moving on from that, his first years as a priest, he lived with the homeless and the marginalized youth. Uh, basically, he he didn't live in like a, a nice lavish rectory, and from the upbringing that he had, he was from a noble type of family, so he he had money, or uh, his family at least had money. I don't know if he himself had money. He probably had some, uh, thinking to his law career, um, that he probably had some money saved up. So I, I find this very interesting that he spent uh, his first years as a priest living with the marginalized youth and the homeless. So... Pretty interesting, a lot to glean from that. During his years as a priest, he, he had a plain and simple preaching style. And he is quoted as saying, I have never preached a sermon which the poorest old woman in the congregation could not understand. So he was able to communicate to people uh, in a plain and simple way that they could understand him and, you know, get the message that he was preaching, which I think is, you know needed a lot more, especially in churches or in um, in different types of settings where you have somebody that is of a quote-unquote higher nature, that they're not too highbrow that, you know, the common person cannot understand them. Because I see that a lot of times whenever reading different uh, articles or reading uh, or listening to different lectures and stuff like that. Sometimes you get like this highbrow type of sense from people and it's like, okay, why are you talking around in circles? Why are you doing a lot of double talk and not just saying plainly what it is? So I really appreciate that whenever somebody has a plain way of speaking. I know I talk around in circles, but it's more to explain the why behind what I do more than it is uh, to try to be highbrow, if you get what I'm saying here. Anyway, he founded the Congregation for the Most Holy Redeemer, uh, and its goal was to teach and preach in the slums of the cities and poor places. So he really had an affinity for dealing with the poor and, uh, and helping out the poor. And he also seems to have had a passion for teaching, uh, for helping people whether it's through financial means or through uh, teaching them how to live a better life or just in general preaching to them as his, um, his profession is as a priest. 
he also disagreed heavily with Jainism, which is like predestination and original sin and all the all of that stuff and you guys can look that up separately maybe I might do a video on that separately I don't know let me know in the comments below if you would like that he is quoted as saying penitents should be treated as souls to be saved rather than as criminals to be punished and I think there's a lot that can be said for that whenever we actually see a person as a person or as a soul as a being that needs help uh, not necessarily in the Christian sense of being saved, but as somebody that needs help or needs assistance in some way. I think there's a lot to glean from that rather than saying, well, you know, you just have a bad life and you know what, you kind of brought it on yourself and punishing people for that. Uh, there's a lot more of a redeeming quality to what he's saying here rather than a condemning uh, quality. So I think that's important to note, and that's why I put it in my in my outline. Um, he was also a gifted m musician and composer. Some of his hymns are still sung today uh, in churches. So if you're interested in hymns and music in general, you can still find some of his uh, works used through throughout uh, the Holy See. He was made a bishop in 1762, which, which is interesting because he was made a priest in 1726. So, 2662. I found that kind of interesting. Um, I didn't do the numerology on that. I'm going to real quick do the numerology on that. It is, let's see, uh, 10, 16, so it would be 7. It's a, a spiritual number of 7. So, that's interesting that both times that he... I guess elevated in the church would be the best way to put it. Uh, made a priest and made a bishop is both correlating with a seven year. So I find that interesting. I didn't do all of the numerology for this and nor am I going to do the numerology for this. But interesting things if you are into numerology and that's one of the things that I found interesting was both of them were in a seven year. So anyway, moving on from that, I found it interesting that he did not want to be a bishop. Uh, he kind of like fought it tooth and nail, but had to accept in the in the end. And this goes to show how much he didn't want to be a bishop and um, or be made a bishop, and how much he was actually satisfied being just a priest. Uh, so much so that he sold his Episcopal ring and gave the money to the poor he really again had that affinity for helping out the poor uh, being a a caregiver to the poor and helping them out so usually you don't see a bishop without their ring it's just not something that you see so i found that very interesting that he sold his ring his holy ring and gave the money to the poor um, finally, he retired in 1775 after suffering pa a painful sickness, and I think through many years um, he suffered from rheumatism. I I saw that in my in my studies that he suffered from rheumatism from fairly early on. Uh, there was a point in his life where he had to drink from tubes because he was so bent over from rheumatism and joint pain and stuff like that uh, and I, I'm not a medical professional so I don't know all the nuances to it um, I've never dealt with anything like that nor do I really know anybody that's dealt with that type of pain but apparently he was bent over so much that he couldn't even uh, drink with his neck coming up he had to be uh, he had to receive drinks through a tube because he was so bent over. So I thought that was important to note how much he suffered uh, in this time. So moving on from that, he died August 1st, 1787, which became his feast day. And, and some highlights throughout his life, he was a prolific and popular author. He wrote 111 works. Um, which are still studied today. Some of them are still studied today. Um, some of his doctrines that he um, proposed to the church have been uh, put into act through the church. Um, I hope I'm saying that correctly. 
I'm not a Catholic, so I don't know. But I know a lot of his teachings were uh, incorporated into the church doctrine is probably the best way to say that. Again, he was a musician, and his hymns are still sung today. Uh, he was a painter, a poet, and an author, and he did all of this all at once. So, so I think it's really inspiring to see how much he was able to do in his lifetime. One thing that I learned from the lives of the saints is that he spent time in rigorous study. He was always um, either learning or writing. He was always doing something dealing with theology or uh, with the teachings of the Bible or uh, through canon law and all that stuff. So he was always studying, he was always writing, he was always improving himself. He was a constant learner and he was also a constant teacher through his writings and his preaching and all that. So that that's one thing that I found very interesting that really uh, kind of inspired me that he was constantly educating himself and didn't just say, you know what, I know all about this, I'm going to move on. He was constantly learning, constantly striving to better himself as well as the people around him. So that that's one of the things that I took away from the life of St. Al Alphonsus, <laughs> from St. Al, um, is that he was a constant learner. He, he was rigorous in his learning and in his writing. So that was one of my takeaways, along with the importance for caring for others no matter what he was going through his constant pain his health problems and all that he constantly wanted to help others as well as he wanted to learn he put in probably i, I would guess he probably put in like 20 hour days you know regularly so that that's my assumption that's nothing that i've read on that but i i would assume that he probably put in a lot of very very long days in his studying and in his uh, teaching and in his outreach to the community even through his his pain he powered through that so, so I thought that his passion for teaching and learning uh, was one of the takeaways along with his uh, outreach his reaching out to the people that you know didn't have it so so well and that he did it with all of this pain I thought those were two takeaways that were very important uh, in the life of Saint Al the two cards that really popped out to me in the study of Saint Al was for his rigorous learning the eight of coins which this is the legacy of the divine tarot I do have a review coming up on this, so if you're interested in that, keep your eyes peeled for Tarot Talk Tuesdays. I don't have my schedule in front of me to tell you when, but uh, I do have a review of the Legacy of the Divine Tarot coming up, and uh, that will happen on a Tuesday in the somewhat near future. I have it scheduled. I know that. It's sometime in August. So if you're interested in the artwork, you can see it in that one. But the eight of coins or the eight of pentacles was one that really jumped out to me that that's the card that i associate with rigorous study and usually in traditional tarot um scenes you see him either sitting there making a coin or studying uh, a coin or doing something that involves studying or being more proficient and to me that was what uh, his rigorous learning and his rigorous studying. And so this is the card that popped out to me with regards to his constant studying and uh, learning about his own faith as well as teaching it to others. So the eight of whoops so the eight of coins or the eight of pentacles depending on your deck is one that really popped out to me and um, really called out to me to share when talking about Saint Al. The other one that came out to me was the Six of Coins. His ability to give and be a charitable person to those in need. The people that don't have a lot or might not know a lot. This was a card for me of him giving 
either his money from the sale of his Episcopal ring or uh, through his time, through his energy, um, giving of knowledge, giving of money, giving of resources in some way, shape, or form. That's why I picked the Six of Coins or the Six of Pentacles. So that to me really spoke of St. Al. Other things to note about St. Al, again, his feast day is on the 1st of August. Uh, his day of the week is on Thursday. The candle color is purple. It doesn't say anything in the magical power of the saints. It doesn't say anything in there about certain herbs or certain drinks or anything like that for him that I that I found. It might say it more in the rest of the book, but, but in the general layout of St. Al, it didn't have anything in particular about herbs or drinks or anything like that. So if you guys want to do further research on that and put it in the bottom bar, it would be much appreciated. But from my resources of The Power of the Saints by Reverend Ray T. Mabra, uh, I'm sorry for mispronouncing that, um, and everything else that I've seen, I haven't seen anything that really calls out as far as an herb to use um, in veneration of St. Al. He is particularly uh, petitioned in cases of rheumatic fever, which he had, and disease. Uh, I guess this is disease in general. Um, arthritis, gout, ailments that affect the joints and muscles, and osteoarthritis. So these are like diseases that he either had or that he has dealt with in some sort of capacity. Um, so he would really be a good saint that if you are suffering from any of these types of uh, ailments that you know you might want to call on Saint Al and say hey you know can you help me out and one of the prayers and this is where I'm going to leave you guys um, one of the prayers that you can use with Saint Al comes from the lives of the Saints and it goes as follows God you constantly introduce new examples of virtue in your church. Walking in the footsteps of St. Oliphantus, your bishop, may we be consumed with zeal for souls and attain the rewards he has won in heaven. Amen. So that's one prayer that you can use. You can also, of course, come up with your own uh, prayer, your own type of ritual and whatnot. And, you know, the way that I'm going to honor St. Al um, this week or on his feast day in particular is, you know, possibly saying a, a prayer or uh, making a petition for those who have certain ailments, um, you know, really honoring him in that way of either doing a petition or a prayer for those who might not have it so easy whenever it comes to health issues. And I'm also going to honor St. Al this week, uh, particularly on his uh, feast day, by really getting into some studying. Uh, there's so many different things that I want to be studying, so um, honoring him in that way of rigorous study I think would be a good way to honor St. Al. Um, so yeah, I think that's how I'm going to do it. Possibly by burning a purple candle and focusing on the rigorous study during the time of that burning of the candle and whatnot. So I think that's what I may do for honoring St. Al. Um, to honor St. Martha this week, what I did was I cleaned house, uh, or at least I cleaned certain parts of the house that have not been cleaned or have been neglected, um, honoring her in that uh, in that time of the housekeeping zone, um, honoring her in that, um, just venerating her and remembering her in that way is something that I did while cleaning the house, uh, you know, noting that today wa was her feast day type of thing. So I do have to say that I'm sorry that this video is coming up 
later on Saturday. I hope that it's not too late that you can still go out and get uh, whatever supplies that you need and whatnot. And if you don't like having the feast day this close to the video, do let me know by leaving a comment in the bottom bar and I will try to mix up the previously scheduled saints so they correlate on Saturdays or on the following Sundays or on a Friday or something like that. So if this is too close to the video, do let me know and I'll, I'll try to be more accommodating to that. Anyway. This video is going to be really long and it's going to be hectic to edit, so I'm going to close with saying may you have love, hugs, and ladybugs. Bye-bye.